Welcome back. Mm. So we've been through the earth two weeks ago, a week ago, we've done the fire, and here we are entering one of the most magical elements because it's going to bring us some beautiful balance with last week talk, the waters. Mm. Water. So we see the the men are the fire keeper and the women are the water protector. What is that? Did you hear that before, Marita? I would love to get yeah. your, your take on that. <laughs> this duality of the masculine and the feminine. And yeah. this, in my tradition, they sit on the opposite of the altar, right? They face each other, the east and the west. Mm -hmm. And so it's always an invitation for like, there must be some really interesting synchronicity and balance and harmony between them. Mm -hmm. waters, waters and uh and the ability to hold both to transcend right to be in that space of balance uh and that's those are the people who make the food right um <laughs> <laughs> which is true right in in the mush tradition in in Sapotec, uh, the people that i come from there are um uh they are the care the caretakers right the mush people um who are people who decide who are born you know uh, masculine and uh, walk in the world as feminine, right? And our caretakers. And so I think, you know, when it comes to water, you know, we love to talk about the waters inside of, of our being, right? That we're made of water. And part of what we don't talk about is also the water in, that keeps our brain functioning, right? You know, intaking and stuff like that. And so to be a keeper of water, and we talk about how water is life, is to be a keeper of cycles, you know, to be in that relation. So that's why so many people uh, talk about water being so connected to the moon and moon cycles being connected to to women in, in a way. Um, also to elephants. Did you know that elephants uh, worship the moon? I, I was just reading that. About that. No. Oh yeah, they do. They like get together and they like sway and they like wave branches. I was reading an article. Someone just sent that to me. And so for me, if we look at animals, right, as wisdom keepers, and you have the elephant, right, who's so big, right, can hold so much water. You have the camel as well. And then in the plant kingdom, the cactus, I believe that when we go to that as keepers of water and keepers of wisdom who teach us, what does it mean to be in deep relationship to having a container that knows its needs and knows that it has water. Humans forget that we are water, mm -hmm. right? And so I always find it so important to go to all of those other kingdoms that are non-human, that are keepers of water, that are wisdom carriers of water, whether they're wisdom carriers of the moon cycles, right, in relation like the elephants, whether they're uh, uh, cactuses that bloom in the moonlight, right? Just to have some, I have some Pedro that's been blooming in the moonlight. It's just so spectacular. I think for me, I love to go to them, right? Because as humans, we have this tendency of defining things. Mm -hmm. And I think when we go to the plant kingdom and we go to places and spaces that have been in relation to water longer than humans have, then we start to really understand how water is life. It came before us. Other beings have been in relation to it longer than we have. No wonder we don't know how to keep our waters. No wonder why we don't need know how to keep them clean or how, how important they are. We haven't been in relation with them so long. Mm. And so I think for this teaching, let's go to the other kingdoms, right? Who have been in relation, who, have rem who remember being birthed from water mm. and sit with them. And say, how do I do this? How can I learn as a creature who is still young, right? Where humans are young. How can I, as a baby, right, crawling around, trying to be a human, learn to be in relation to that water? How about you? Yeah, I feel tender when I think of the water. Um, you know, to weave on what you were saying, we, we 
don't know how to take care of the water. We love to trap and contain the water to <laughs> prevent it from moving and flowing. There is a, a dynamic in the Western world of controlling this element. We built dam on rivers. We put water in pipes and in bottles. We uh, hold our emotions in, right? We don't want the waters to move. In the Andes, in the mountain, the waters are called the cosmic waters. It's not just the water. They're called the cosmic waters. There is mm -hmm. a story that the waters, they came from space through meteorites. Mm -hmm. The story says some people brought those waters until so they're coming from afar. And it's interesting because we talked about the earth element, which is this underworld, this inside the belly. And then we have the fire, which is kind of this middle world we are in and moving and acting and doing our asanas and things <laughs> we create. <laughs> and then we have the upper world and the wind. And the water, they are non local. The water is this one element in that cosmology that is the connector that needs to move, that constantly rise, goes through the three worlds, go back, mm -hmm. get that information with the stars in the clouds, get that high vibration, and then fall back on the earth to bring back the teaching. It always fascinated me that if I give a choice to my cat or even my chicken, <laughs> the water to drink, if it's fresh water that falls from the sky, if there was even lightnings, that's even better. They even prefer that. They will go to that pot of water instead of any water that I can give to them that's coming maybe from the tap. Mm -hmm. They know. And farmers know that. They know that their animals, their cows or their horses are going to look for that. They remember the prayer of the water, that is free water, the vibration of the water. There is a whole beautiful field of exploring the memory of the water mm -hmm. that has beautiful impact in vibrational medicine uh, that is used or right? homeopathic remedies and flower essence. Saying that the water, once they've been in contact with some elements, some vibration, some information, they carry it. And it doesn't matter how much you dilute this water, you can still find that trace vibration. And so if you think that way, I always feel like, so the water, remember the whole story of the universe, of this earth mm -hmm. being born. Water is not created on earth and doesn't, is not destroying us. We have the same quantity since day one, which is kind of bizarre, right? So that water was there before we were here. And in order for the water to be clear and clean, we always say she needs to be free. She needs to move. She needs to go through different states. And it's our emotional body. You know, comfortable are, are we with moving our waters? Grief that in the Western world is not really accepted very much. In an indigenous society, it's done collectively. It's not something individual already. It's, we, we carry the water together. We move the water together. And it's a reflection of the state of the water in the world today. Indeed, our ocean are going to be polluted. Indeed, we are going to have problem between flooding or drought because this is this imbalance again of relation with this very mystical element of all. Yeah. You know, when they say that you're enlightened. You what do you do before, during enlightenment and after enlightenment? Chop wood, carry water, right? It, it doesn't stop, right? We have to have relationship to the fire and to the water before, during, and after. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being here on islands in the middle of Pacific, you know, it, the cosmology, ideology, identity of the people of the islands here is one of water, not yeah. something that divides them, but, but unites them. And I was born again in, in the Ciudad de Mexico, which was a lake. So I have a lot of experiences of being born on mountaintops, right? In the middle of water, right? And in always water around me. When I lived in the States, I lived in a part of the country where there was five lakes around us, right? 
And so for me, water has always been that opportunity to be in conversation, Mm -hmm. right? In holding. And it teaches you at all times, um, not just preciousness, but the unknown. It allows you to let go. We love to build on land, right? We like to talk about land, even when we're farmers or, you know, people in different worlds love to talk about land. They talk about dirt, even though they don't understand it, right? And they love to talk about it in a lot of industries, yet no one really talks about water because they haven't really tamed it. They haven't been able to sell it off. They haven't been able to conquer it. They're trying to mine it right now. You know, the the ocean, that's a whole nother thing. They don't know how to build on it. And so here we have an element that humans haven't completely exploited and contained or figured it all out. And yet it is the element that exists beyond land. And so I feel like part of the lesson of water and part of the lesson of this planet is not to be in control, Mm. to not create from the known. And whenever we're talking, you know, when people are manifesting, right, there's so much energy and fire and land behind that building, right? Mm. But so much, and we've had conversations about creating from the unknown, creating from the void, creating from primordial water, waters. What are the primordial waters? And that is to sit in the unknown. So for me, sitting with the water and the reflection of water and all the kingdoms is to sit with that which I don't know. And am I okay with that? right? Because as a human, we're always trying to understand, right? And sometimes we don't even know how to ask questions. Most of the questions I get from people are just people trying to be like, I'm right. You know, you know how you ask those questions and I'm like, that's not really a question. And so we're always checking in as humans, if we're okay, do we know enough? Are we loved enough? Can I build relationship? Can I build this, build bridges, right? And bridges are built over chasms, over waterways, over things. And so what's below us? the place where we don't know how to connect. And so I think today an opportunity, right? Since a lot of the world does have access to tap water, right? Is to think of all of those people, right? Who don't, who make journeys to have drinking water to all those people who are uh, stewards really of oceans and understand that in in such a deep way that the land people don't and drop our wisdom drop what we know stop building dams right and just allow ourselves to float right there's some there's now float float rooms all over right people are doing Mm -hmm. ice baths with water so there's something in our consciousness in our modernity that is trying to go back in a way, right? And use that element, as you said, and its vibration to restart, re-nurture, re-acclimate. And I really welcome people that water is that place, either whether it's grief or knowing or collecting to be in relation with that which is unknown. And can you allow yourself that unknown? Mm. Yeah, the water, and we say carry the, the prayer of clarity, the clear water, the clean water. Clarity is seeing clearly, like the ego, you know, seeing from this higher vantage point. It's connection, as you say, right? It's this connection because she's a connector, because she moves, she has to move. So she knows how to move. She knows how to connect the different world meaning she knows how to connect our subconscious inner world with our conscious middle world, with our dream states, that other state of consciousness. So if we can develop, not just, you know, having nice uh, swimming in the river, which is nice, or in the oceans, but really trying to listen to her, to understand her, you know, and how am I caring for the water of the world? Very often, it's bringing us back to how clearly do I see what's really happening? You know, what is my vision? Do I have the eagle vision that fly above the water, that protects the water? 
Or am I just standing right and just seeing the tree and not the forest anymore? So there are a lot of confusion in the world. <laughs> very often that we call clarity. <laughs> uh, people are very sure of this or we're very sure of that, right? But when we take the other view, when we invite the water, when we let our emotions flow, we usually, that cleans our eyes, right? It's interesting. Uh, why is that? Why does the tears clear the eyes? The grief could have come another way, right? We clear the eyes, <laughs> clear the sight. And that's this ancient prayer. That when the water moves, they return to the cosmos, they return to the star, and they have this view. And when they, what do they do after that? They come back. They surrender again. They descend again. They return to the earth to give life back, to enrich the earth again, to rebirth the seed, to rebirth ourselves. So you can see the water has so many layers, and I feel that What's really missing in the Western world today is our capacity to grieve, to move our water collectively. I think that if we were to fall on our knees and really grieve uh, all what is happening, all what has happened, I think a lot of conflict will stop. I think a lot of new solution will arise. And so there is really a... Uh, I would say an emergency, but we need to slow down more than we accelerate. An emergency to slow down, to feel those waters in our bodies, to listen to the water in the landscape, in the sky, in the ground, and to take that time every day to soften so those waters mm -hmm. can, can move, can be free again. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful and such a beautiful opportunity and invitation you know to to be and to learn and to listen and to feel and i hope all of us will take time today to be with water our waters inside the waters of others in the collective and to learn from other kingdoms of how can we be in relation to water thank you, thank you.